of Bob Highlands. Let us join Pastor Bob as he shares today's lesson. Today I want to share with you a simple truth. And by that I mean I want to teach more than I ever do normally. And I know I'm more of a teaching than a preaching pastor anyway. But this morning I really do want to teach. And I want to take this effort to say that this is a truth that runs contrary to the teachings of the world, runs most contrary to a lot of things being said within churches today. But it's a biblical truth that I hold strongly to. Now, when I say a biblical truth, that even runs contrary to what a lot of pastors are doing now. I know that uh, um, one of my favorite preaching pastors, I enjoy Andy Stanley, but Andy Stanley in the last two weeks came out and said, he will not anymore from safe in the pulpit, the Bible says. He says, because it no longer carries the authority it did, so he's not going to say it. And I thought that was contradictory in my own, my own frame of mind. I am a pastor. I believe in the Bible. I am not going to let the world determine what I believe or how I approach my ministry. And so I want to say that this is biblical truth, even if it's not worldly truth. So as we gather this morning for that. Now, <clears throat> there's a word missing in the Gospel of John. A word that appears in the other three Gospels that, that's powerful and stands out and which we need to talk about for a second this morning before we go into John. John is uh, in Matthew, the third chapter, verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the way of the Lord. The word repent doesn't appear in John, which is ironic and when we think about what, it, what it, we have in that book, what it says in the book. Now, repent is a word that movies misrepresent, the popular culture. You, you, you see a preacher in a movie, on a TV show, and he gets real red in the face, and it's real angry, and he just, like he's almost like spitting out, you know, angry as he speaks, and he'll go, repent. You know, like, it, like it's this terrible word. But the word is exactly the opposite of the way they portray it. It's not a word of anger. It's not a word of, of, of God's going to get you. It's a word which, which carries with it love and kindness. John is standing on the riverbank, and he is speaking to the people who are coming to them, and he knows what God's about to do, that sins are about to be forgiven, that the way's about to be lifted, the world's about to be changed, and all they have to do is change the direction of their life. And so John is saying, and we'll take the word, keep the word repent out for a minute, John is saying, guys, change the direction of your life. Turn to God. He's got something great for you, a gift that you just cannot imagine. If you'll just change how you're living and lay down your sinful lives and come to God, he loves you. When John says repent, it's a plea. John's not angry. John's begging them, imploring them. He's saying the kingdom of heaven, the greatest thing that God has, is about to be offered. <clears throat> John knows the truth. When you come to God, I want to say this morning, we're going to talk about this this morning, when you come to God, it's either the wine or the whip. I want to take two instances this morning from the very beginning of the Gospel of John and share them with you and have you understand that there are two sides to God that you need to understand, or two, I don't want to say two faces of God because that will come off wrong, but there are two parts of God's personality that you and I need to understand. <laughs> On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. 
When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. This morning, I want to start with some biblical facts. And when I say I'm starting with biblical facts, these are things that I think we need to understand and we need to put in perspective, and I want all of us to be coming off the same page. <clears throat> now, even in saying this, I come here before you this morning, and um, you're an eclectic group of people. You know that? I mean, and every one of you comes with your own spiritual background. Every one of you comes with uh, an input into you that is come from so many different sources, and you come here on Sunday mornings, and sometimes you'll ask me questions it's like, why am I supposed to know that? And I work on it, try to get you answers. But we, we're here this morning, and I think that we all need to be coming off the same page, or at least knowing what the page is I'm coming off of. So, as I said a while ago, I'm going to mostly teach this morning. I want to help you understand this truth, even if the world doesn't because it's foundational. So I want to start this morning with, with this fact. Heaven is exclusive, and there are requirements getting in. There are no exceptions to the rule. Revelation 20, first chapter, verse 27 says, Nothing impure will ever enter it, meaning heaven, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the words shameful and deceitful are abominations and lyings is the exact word what they mean. So we have the concept that says nothing impure will ever enter it. And I, I tell you that nothing has ever bad been there, nothing ever bad will be there, nothing ever bad ever can get in there. Before you ever get to heaven, the decisions are made. Heaven is not some place where you show up and God kind of work it out for a couple weeks and see whether he likes you or not. Jesus is exclusive when it comes to how a person gets to heaven. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, heaven is the end goal of all life as a believer. It's where we're going to end up. It's what Jesus has promised. It's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. It's eternal. It's where he sits now on a throne waiting and so you and I have to understand that it, as uh, we look at this, that heaven is exclusive. There's no sin going to be allowed in there, nor a sinful person allowed in there. It is exclusive that you have to come through Jesus Christ. All the religions of the world are not the way. There is only one way. And that may not be popular with the world, but that's popular with me because it's popular in the Word of God, and I'm hanging on to the Word of God. Jesus is the exclusive judge who will face, we will face at the end. Now, most people think, well, I'm going to be before God when I die. But in the book of John, it says in John 5, 2, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. 
Now, we're talking here this morning, and I want you to understand that when John is crying out, repent, change the direction of your life, he's saying, I want you to be able to go to heaven. I want you to be able to get past the judge. I want you to, everything to work out good for you. Jesus is the exclusive payment accepted by God for our sins. John 3, 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So we have this, this conditional set of exclusions which we line up, we begin to put together. And the next one, maybe you're unaware of, but I want to be sure that you understand the next one. The Holy Spirit is the exclusively or exclusive. He's the defense attorney, the prosecuting attorney, and he's the jury in heaven. Now let me read a scripture for you. John 16, verses 8 through 11. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can no longer see me. In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now let me put the picture for you, if I can, a little bit. When you die... Oh, did I forget to tell you you're going to die? I... When you die, and by the way, if you're unaware of it, about 154,000 people die every day in the world. About 6,000 people die every hour. People who got up this morning at this, someplace in the world, 154,000 of them thought this was just another day. And it's the last day. When they leave this world, they are headed towards a judgment with Jesus Christ as the judge. And I want to be sure that you understand as we go through this this morning, when we talk about Jesus Christ being the judge, Jesus Christ being the judge does not decide where you go. You do. Now, we have the Holy Spirit, and if you get the picture, let's say that this morning it was my day. Just joking, Dada, okay? And I found myself that this is, I wanted 154,000, that I was one of the 6,000 that died in a certain hour. I find myself standing before the judge himself, Jesus Christ. The process is, it says, Peter says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So I will be before God. The only thing I have to do is confess because at that point, whether I believe or not, I will then believe. I guarantee you, people, if they've never seen Jesus, they will believe then. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the prosecuting and defense attorney at the same time. It says he will convict concerning sin or righteousness. If I am a sinner, the, the Holy Spirit will come in and he will be a prosecuting attorney. and He will stand before Jesus Christ, who is the judge, and say, this one here does not know you. This one here has lived a sinful life. Or the Holy Spirit may come in as my defense attorney and speak and say, this one here has... Their name is, they've turned their life over to you. Look, their name is even in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, right here. Your book, Jesus. Now, one step further, the Holy Spirit, not Jesus, is the jury. Because the Holy Spirit will say, this person either deserves to go to heaven or this person deserves to go to hell. And the reason is, is because the Holy Spirit convicts. Now you say, isn't Jesus the judge? What's the job of the judge? The job of the judge is when all the evidence is done and all the order has been maintained, the judge stands forth and brings forth the judgment. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 25, uh, 25th chapter, verse 46, Jesus said this about judgment. He says, Then they, the unrighteous, will go away to eternal punishment and the righteous to eternal life. What is the job of the judge? To execute the judgment. If I die today and I'm right with Jesus Christ, the judgment will be eternal life. Not because Jesus Christ has decided he wants me to go to heaven, but because I have decided I want to go to heaven and accept what he's done for me. But if I, if this morning, found myself before God and was not right with God, had not accepted Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ would not say, hey, you know, I think I like you anyway, I'm going to let you in. That's not his job. A judge is to judge and be fair. And the judge will either give us what we've asked for in either condition. 
No unrighteous person will ever enter into heaven. It says, and I read again, nothing impure will ever enter it. And then we also have the, um, we have this concept that you and I need to understand one more thing, and I just throw this in separate a little bit because it's not really real tightly related, but let me tell you this. In Mark 3.29, it says, Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. I get the picture. Let's say that I have blasphemed. I said, I don't like the Holy Spirit, and I don't believe in the Holy Spirit, and I just cast the Holy Spirit out of my life and refuse to let the Holy Spirit in my life. I won't have anything to do with them. And I show up at heaven. I show up for the judgment. Who is the prosecuting attorney? Who is the jury? <laughs> Guess what, folks? We don't even have to get any further than that. Holy Spirit's going to say, huh, we don't have to look in the book. I already know. You and I must understand the biblical facts that I want you to understand this morning is this. Heaven is exclusive. There's only one way in, and that way requires accepting the blood of Jesus Christ. And we will stand in judgment, and we will not defend ourselves because the decision when we die will have already been made, and we have made it while we're here today, while we're alive. So all of you understand this morning, there are some basic biblical facts the world is ignoring. Judgment is coming. And today, 154,000 people, ready or not, are going to learn that fact is true. Now, <clears throat> I want to start with a statement, wine is fine. Now, I already said that we come with different points of view, so I'm going to do a legal disclaimer here this morning to get started with. You know how those you know, on the radio, except they always do them at the end real fast so that you can know what we're talking about, and you, you know, okay. First of all, I want to say that I am a total teetotaler. You know what that is? Yeah. I don't drink alcohol at all. But, ba but I want you to send the basic truth of the Bible is, the Bible says it's not a sin to drink. The Bible says it's a sin to be drunk. And so there's, there's a difference here. And I want you to know I'm a teetotaler, have been since 1971 when I became saved. I am such a teetotaler that my brother died uh, several years ago and they brought down the bottle of alcohol and got it down and everybody got a glass. I got a glass of ginger ale because I was not violating that even for my brother. Last February when my father passed away and they all got down his Johnny Walker blue, green, orange label. I don't know what it was, something or other. And they all had a drink. I had some orange juice. I am a teetotaler. My children have said that if they ever see me drinking, they know the world has come to an end or it's in bad shape. <laughs> <clears throat> so when I say wine is fine, I, I, I'm not just I'm making a statement that I want you to understand. It goes deeper. It's, it's, a, it's an image. But if you're here this morning and you have trouble with alcohol and you don't drink it because you're an alcoholic or because somebody member of your family was and it bothers you, understand I'm not telling you that you, I'm against your conviction at all. Jesus was at the wedding. He turned water into wine. I read a book a few years ago where a man was trying to prove that he turned the water into grape juice. But I remember reading in the scripture, and it said here this morning, you know, most of the time you wait until they've drunk and they can't taste it anymore because they're so drunk they don't know what's going on. <laughs> then you bring out the bad wine. Now, like I said, I haven't had wine in forever. I had a person talking to me the other day, and they were talking about well, good wine and bad wine, and when they were talking about the wine, uh, uh, they said, you know, uh, they had gone to Trader Joe's or someplace like that, and they got a uh, bottle of wine on sale that cost $2. Uh, yeah. And then the person said, you know, after the first sip, I knew why it was a $2 bottle of wine. <laughs> Jesus did not make two dollar wine and put in those vases i guarantee you that so this morning i want you to know that as we talk about the wine that i'm talking about a symbol here a symbol of purity a symbol of quality a symbol of what he wants to do for you so when i say wine is fine i've given you all the disclaimers i can right up front he came from the Father, it says, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who the book of John is about. And grace is the, the 
kindness of God. It is the mercy and forgiveness that is not deserved and cannot be earned. I did nothing to become a Christian except accept what Jesus Christ has done for me. If I live a hundred years as a Christian, I will never ever have done anything which deserves what God is going to give me. It is because of His mercy and forgiveness that He pours out uh, this gift. But it also says not only does He have this, this gift, this forgiveness that we don't deserve, that is this poured out on us, says, He talks about truth. He's, he is full of kindness, and He's grace and truth. Truth is the certainty of a fact that is absolute without any question. Now, I know we live in a world where there are no absolutes, or at least it doesn't seem to be. Everything changes every day. You know, last week the doctors told you this, this week the doctors told you that, last week this was good for you, this week this is bad for you. It goes like that all the time. We have to know, you have to know, the Bible does have absolutes. And there are truths in this world which transcend what you and I feel or think or experience. And my feelings and my thoughts do not change the Word of God. They may be in conflict with the Word of God, but they don't change the Word of God. So we have that truth is an absolute without any questions. And we've, I gave you a list on the first page here we talked about a minute ago. I believe all of these are absolute truths. Heaven is, it has exceptions. The only way you can get in, the only way is Jesus Christ. These are absolutes. They don't change. Turning the water into wine is a demonstration of the mercy and grace and forgiveness of God. It shows you a side of Jesus Christ that we all need to know and understand. I've received it. I told you a couple weeks ago by my salvation experience. I told you how God had forgave me and how He changed me and how He moved in my life to bring me to that point. I didn't deserve it. It's a free gift. But he changed me. He took that which had no value and gave it value. In fact, he went to what we talked about a minute ago. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit has been put in my life as a deposit guaranteeing my, my eternal inheritance. Another reason I want to kick the Holy Spirit out is because it gives the only value to my life. You and I have to understand that, that this side of Jesus Christ, he's at this wedding, he's not angry, he's not upset, he's just kind of going along, and there's this emergency, this need that comes up, and what does Jesus do? Does he, he go like, he looks at his mother and says, that's not really my time, but what does he do? Does he answer? Sometimes we pray and we ask things and he answers them anyway, even though it's not the biggest thing in the world. But whenever he answers, whenever he works in our life, he does it right. He loves us, he cares for us. It can be big things, it can be little things, but He's there for us. Turning the water into wine is, his, uh, uh, is about His absolute truth. This demonstrates His power, and if He can do that, He can do anything, including tell the truth. The miracles in the book of John are God's way of demonstrating who Jesus is, so we'll listen to what He says. You know, the, the book of John, we had in class this morning, we talked about it. The book of John is mostly teaching, but we usually see the big, these, uh, these miracles that take place. Jesus Christ wants us to know that he loves us. He cares for us. He's a good guy. There are people in the world today who only believe this is the only thing we need to know about Jesus. Jesus loves you and dies for you, and everything you do is okay because Jesus loves you. Jesus is the God of love. God is a God of love. There's even the teaching that has risen up again recently saying, well, the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. I have difficulty with that. They're saying the God of the Old Testament was too angry. He cannot be like Jesus. But when you begin to weigh it out, you begin to understand that, that this God who is in the Bible is a God who has two distinct personalities. One is mercy and the other is justice. And here Jesus is showing that he's a merciful, loving, kind. He wants to do great things for us. But we read through the book of John, and we come to the second chapter, and he turns the water into wine, and there's a big celebration. Hey, this is great. But what happens next? He travels down the road with his disciples a little distance, and when he gets down the road a little ways, he comes to the temple, and when he gets to the temple, what happens? Well, he walks into the temple, and there, 
they're in there and they're selling sheep and goats and animals and they're selling them for too much and they're blemished and they're not holy and they're not the way it should be. They're exchanging coins and they're cheating the people out of the coins. They're selling them doves to the, to the poor people instead of being uh, whole and nice. They have broken wings and broken feathers and they're, they're not exactly sh- should be and they're charging too much. So what does Jesus do? Jesus goes in with a whip. Now, even as he does this, he shows his kindness at this point. He drives the cattle out. Where do the cattle go? Out in the street. So what do the people who own them do? They go out and get them. He flips the tables over with all the coins on them, and the coins are flying everywhere. What are those people doing? They're down on their knees picking up the coins, right? But then he turns to the people who have doves, and if Jesus goes over and opens those cages, what's going to happen to those doves? They'll be gone forever. Jesus looks at him and says, get them out of here. You see, even in his justice, he's trying to be kind. And here is Jesus Christ. And he has cleaned the temple and he's shown us another side of who he is. He is is the person who turns water into wine. He's the person that loves you and cares for you and wants to answer your prayers. But he is also a God of justice. By myself, I can do nothing, he says. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. We have this concept of Jesus Christ saying to each one of us that I will be a judge when the time comes. I will sit on the throne in front of you when your day to leave this world comes and you stand before me. Judgment is not Jesus making a choice concerning our life and where we'll spend eternity. Judgment is Jesus honoring the choice that we have already made. I mentioned those 6,000 people that will die this hour in this world. When they die, they have made a choice. If they are Christian believers, they will stand before Him and find their way to eternity. If they are not, they will not. Jesus said clearly, for judgment I I, I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. What's his judgment? He's saying, if you see me, if you're blind and see me, you have sight. But if you think you have sight and you don't understand and you think you can do anything you want, you're in trouble. The whip of God's judgment is God dealing with sin and sinful people. It is the opposite of God's mercy. We're here this morning, and I'm trying to just demonstrate a truth to you. I believe this is the truth that John understood when he stood in the riverbank. He looked at the people coming, and he realized that if they weren't ready, they would face a judge and be separated from God forever. But he knew if he could get them to change their direction, if he knew if he could get them to find Jesus Christ and, and make the commitment they needed to, they would be with God forever. And so when he's standing there going, repent, he's, he's, not, he's not angry with him. He's saying, come on, guys. This is really, really, really important because it's eternal. And so it comes down to a choice. You can look at the whip and the wine in contrast to the wine and the whip in contrast. To, the wine is about mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And I give you two words. It's unearned and undeserved. You didn't do anything for it. Nobody can do anything for it, but it's available to everyone. It's about God doing something special. And the whip is about justice, earnings, and rejection. Now, I want to be careful here because some people say, okay, is it justice what God is doing? Yeah, you earned it. You say, well, how do I earn eternal punishment? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. God is going to pay you. Or you can turn around and you can take the wine and you can say, God, I want your mercy instead. I want you to change me. I want you to come into my life. I want you to take that which is not usable, that which is not the best, and make me something special and, and work in my life. The choice is one that has eternal ramifications in our lives. Now, I want to give you um, two scriptures here, and I want to talk about them for a second. First is Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now, I need to set it up. Joshua has gone into the promised land. They've crossed the Jordan. They've gone up the hill. They've wiped out Jericho. They've been going around taking on all the enemies. And Joshua comes and he realizes that this is their land now. And he gathers the people together for one big, more important announcement. 
He says, you're all going to go get your own homes now, and you're going to set up and live in different towns. We're not going to be traveling around together and conquering people. He says, so here's what I need you to know. You can make a choice. You can serve the gods like we served in Egypt. The gods like that were here before we got here. He says, or you can make the choice. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. The old gods or the God who's been with us. And he says, look it back and look at all the choices that have come in your life and realize that today you have a choice to make. And the people go, we're going to serve God. Now, they didn't do it very long or very well. In Matthew, the second chapter, verse 3, we have John saying, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. And this is also a choice. The people had to choose, will we choose God? The old God or the new God? And that's what John was saying at the riverbank. You have a choice to make. Who are you going to choose to be your God? Who are you going to choose to be in charge of your life? Do you choose mercy? Or do you choose justice? You see, it's about preparing I don't think about justice every day. I don't think about mercy every day. I don't think about heaven every day. I've been thinking about it a lot this week when I realized how many people were going to die. I want to say this, and it's clearly the message I have. Choose and God honors your choice forever. I started out by saying that John was that in the book of John, the word repent does not appear, but I believe through the entire book of John, the, reper- the concept of repent is there in every chapter. When he says he's the way and the truth and the life, when he says there's no other way, you know, we have to understand he's calling us to understand that. So I'm not here this morning turning red in the face or spitting out on you. I have the people in the front row, I probably appreciate that. But I am here this morning saying there is absolute truth, And there is a God, a God that you can choose. He can be a God of mercy, a God of love, a God who answers your prayers, who forgives your sin, who helps you every day. And I believe the majority, if not all of you, have taken that, but I hope you have. If you're here this morning and if you have not done that, understand that same God is not going to overlook your sins. That same God is a God of justice. He is the God who flipped over the tables. He is the God who in one hand let the Hebrew people pass through the Red Sea on dry ground, a God of mercy, and turned around and took the Egyptian army and drowned them, a God of justice. And that is the same God. He is the same God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He's the same God that you will stand before at the end of time when the Holy Spirit comes out and is either your defense attorney or the prosecution. And the Holy Spirit will be the one who opens the book and says, look, their name's here or it isn't named, your name isn't there, and that is the final judgment, that's the, the call that happens at that particular point. And all that's left at that moment is for Jesus Christ to execute judgment upon you. And it will be just, and it will be what you ask for. If you haven't asked Him in your life, you need to. If you have, you need to rejoice knowing that eternity is a blessing promised to each one of us.